Welcome to the Trinity Bible College and Graduate School Chapel Podcast. If in any way that related to you, you say amen to. Say, Holy Spirit, take us, use us. Thank you, music team. Day by day, you serve us so well. Bless you. Thank you. Well, good morning, everybody. Uh, I know that we're all sort of looking at the end of this week and the stuff that's happening in the weather, but we're still alive. It's another day to live and serve and give, and so it's great to see you all in chapel this morning. I uh, just want you to know that we have had an amazing board meeting. It's gone extremely well. It's just been uh, a, an amazing couple of days. I want to honor our board chair who's in the room, uh, Pastor Steve and uh, Rachel. I think you are still with us. You were going to be with us. I see you. <laughs> uh, and so it's just a a real delight to have come through those meetings, and uh, the fact that you finish early is normally really good news. It means that you've got through the work, you've got things done, so we've still got several board members with us. Let me say this publicly. This institution is served, uh, certainly from my experience of serving in multiple places all around the world, this institution is served by a remarkable group of women and men who uh, come alongside us, serve us, not just in board meetings, all the way through the year. Uh, they come to us from the nine region, the nine uh, districts that uh, make up our region. So it's wonderful this morning. We've got uh, Roy Rhodes, who's all the way from Illinois. And um, when you see him, by the way, will you just point out that you think that his sweater looks pretty disgusting on him? Um, it's, uh, it, if, if you don't know what the fern is on his sweater, it's uh, the New Zealand rugby team, the All Blacks. They play, they play, they play really bad rugby, and um, uh, so I support every team that beats the All Blacks, if you want to know where I'm at on rugby. But uh, apart from that one little issue, Roy Rhodes is a really great member of our board and a great help. Uh, and then we have Leanne Crowell, who's from... Uh, Iowa, uh, an attorney. In fact, she's head of the legal department of Casey's. So next time they don't give you the right change, you tell them you know people. And uh, <laughs> uh, so uh, it's just been great to have her join us. And then, of course, we have superintendents from all around our region. Uh, what would we do without uh, uh, our good friends Winston and, uh, and, and, and uh, Candace Titus? Uh, they have been friends of the school in profound ways, and it's just great to uh, have you with us. Uh, and, of course, Minnesota is really well represented. Uh, I've spoken of Iowa, uh, the Pilchers there, and uh, um, South Dakota, North Dakota, Montana. They, they sort of left early to get away from something. I don't know, but uh, uh, they're trying to beat the storm, actually, but uh, very well served there. And uh, our dear friends from Wyoming, so all over the region. These are people that are available to you. They want to talk to you. They have opportunities available to you. Serve with full hearts. Get your degrees. Get finished, not just done. What a great word that was. And make sure that during your time at Trinity, when these opportunities come, you meet with these amazing leaders from around our region and see if God doesn't open doors to you that you couldn't have even dreamed or imagined when you first started this journey. And so I want to say to all of our board present, thank you. Thank you for a great meeting. Thank you for all the affirmation. Thank you for the support that you give us. Uh, we've got exciting days ahead. It's just uh, been a very special few days and very affirming to Carol and me. And as a part of our board, it's just a delight this morning to welcome uh, the superintendent of the great state of Wisconsin and northern Michigan. Um, there was a transition in that role just over a year ago, and immediately uh, the new superintendent, Pastor John Davis, said, I'm on board. Count me in with Trinity, and he's been an immense uh, encouragement to us all the way through this time. And so I know that you're going to give him 100% of your attention and enjoy what God has to say through him. Why don't you join me in uh, welcoming Pastor John Davis. Just give him a great Trinity welcome. And John, it's great to have you. John and Diane are doing a great job out in Wisconsin, and we're just so privileged that you're here. Thank you. Thank you for the way you serve our school, and uh, thank you for all that you do. God bless you. Thank you, Dr. Paul, Dr. Carroll. Appreciate you deeply. 
learning to love you more and more with every meeting that takes place with the board and your kindness to Diane and me is, is uh, a reward in our lives. She unfortunately is not here because she's been facilitating a prayer retreat in Wisconsin, Northern Michigan. And by her doing that, I could be here and we'll look forward to next time having her with us. I do also want to thank Twyla. She's ministered in our network before. We love you very much. So good to see you. And learning to know staff and uh, teachers and uh, those of, of you who make your lives here at Trinity just a very special, warm, welcoming place. And I truly was amazed walking through hallways how kind you guys are saying hello and not ignoring somebody who's older than you. So thank you. Very <laughs> so very good. <laughs> Twenty months ago, uh, our church family, Poplar Creek Church in New Berlin, Wisconsin, sent Diane and me away on a sabbatical after being there for 30 years. We had never had a sabbatical before, and I wasn't sure I really wanted a sabbatical because I didn't think I could handle being gone for that long a period of time. And a little did I realize that it would be a life-changing experience where God would uh, speak into us in ways that I had not known since the day of my conversion. But I'll come back to that. Today I want to talk to you about God's hand on your life and pray with all of us in the room to experience the hand of God in a way that makes a difference. Those who surrender their lives to God and his plan experience the hand of God guiding daily circumstances. Even so, the hand of God guiding doesn't always make sense. Quite honestly, for me to be a superintendent does not make sense. I thought I'd forever be a pastor in a, a local church, but God has his ideas and his designs. If you take Joseph, for example, called by God to provide for his family, he did not understand being in prison under false charges, still the hand of God. Or Moses, called by God to lead Israel out of slavery, did not understand 40 years of caring for sheep. And then David, called by God to be king of Israel, certainly did not understand 13 years of running for, from a king Saul who wanted him to be dead. And yet this, too, was the hand of God. When the hand of God is on us, God will accomplish his own agenda. So today we want to understand how the hand of God guides. So we ask, how is God's hand directing the purpose of our lives? In response, I propose three answers. First, God is guiding us to a humble response to Jesus and his word. Second, his hand guiding us to direction and leadership by the Holy Spirit. And last of all, his hand is guiding us to love other people. So to better understand the hand of God, if you have your Bible, please turn to Acts 11, 19 th through 30, where we will learn about the church in Antioch and God's hand building it. There, Jews and Greeks were responding to the good news about Jesus. This church was vibrant. The first group to ever be called Christian came from the Antioch church. If there was ever a church that I wanted Poplar Creek Church to be like, it was the Antioch Church. First of all, God's hand leads us to a humble response to Jesus and his word. Reading from Acts 11, 19 through 21. Now those who had been scattered by the persecution that broke out when Stephen was killed traveled as far as to Phoenicia, Cyprus, and Antioch, spreading the word only among Jews. Some of them, however, men from Cyprus and Cyrene, went to Antioch and began to speak to Greeks also, telling them about the good news about the Lord Jesus. The Lord's hand was with them, and a great number of people believed and turned to the Lord. 
And if I were to ask you to just focus on a pa this passage in part, it would be the Lord's hand was with them and. And God adds the and. The Lord's hand was with them and. A true believer in Christ will experience personal relationship with Jesus. I believe that when Christ comes in, Christians turn from sin and lead a victorious life. We discover the meaning of God's kingdom, disengaging from the world. We're released from habits that destroy and sins that pull our life into destruction. We're able, by the grace of God, to resist the power of Satan. All of this is because God's hand is on us. The strength for this kind of victory is faith in Jesus Christ and living by the promises of God, and he makes us different. We're converted followers of him. Christ becomes personal. He's an involved in every aspect of our personal lives, including home, family, work, friendships, finance, hopes, and dreams. When God's hand is on somebody, they're... At the brand new kind of person that God has intended them to become. So I asked some questions about beginning with Christ and his word. Is the Lord's hand on your life? Are you humble in your response to Jesus and his hand in your life? Are you free from the capacity of sin to dominate you and pull you down? Are you learning how to defeat Satan and his attacks against you? Has God shown you how to have freedom in your finances? And is your home a safe place to be? Home, family, parents, siblings, the people that are around you, is your home a safe place to be? The first time I experienced God's hand on me was after I graduated from high school, 10 days before beginning studies at the University of Illinois with a major in chemical engineering. I decided to go visit an old friend and his family on a Sunday afternoon, and they prevailed upon me to go to church with them that evening. I went to church, a denominational church, but I never knew what it was to have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Speaking at the church that night was a worker from the Pacific Garden Mission in Chicago, and he'd been married the day before, and he was on his honeymoon, and he was in church preaching, and I thought he had to be some crazy kind of a person that that was how he would spend his honeymoon. And yet he challenged me afterwards as to the meaning and the purpose of my life, and before the evening was out, I experienced Christ in a personal way, and God's hand came upon me, dynamically changing me from what I was into what he wanted to, me to be, and I discovered that he was seeking me out, that he had tracked me down, that he had drawn me in, that he was now living inside my heart. Second thought I want to share with you is God ha God's hand leads us to guidance by the Holy Spirit, Acts 11, 22 through 24. News of this reached the church in Jerusalem, and they sent Barnabas to Antioch. When he arrived and saw what the grace of God had done, he was glad and encouraged them all to remain true to the Lord with all their hearts. He was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and faith, and a great number of people were brought to the Lord. The church in Jerusalem had become a mother church for congregations that were being birthed in many different places. They soon heard about the revival that was taking place in Antioch and made a decision to send Barnabas there to help in the formation of their faith, to bring security to their relationship with Jesus. All of this was by the leading of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit was building his church. When Barnabas arrived in Antioch, he was joyful. The people there knew the Lord. They also were digging into his word. Their lives were different than what they had been before because God's hand was upon them. They were in the church. They loved the church. They were converted to the church. The church had deep meaning in their lives. 
So Barnabas set about to disciple the people so that they would remain true to God. They needed to embrace Christ and be his follower. One foot in the world and one foot in the church was not enough. The one who had died and risen from the dead was to be worshipped and receive their wholehearted devotion. They were to give to Jesus every part of who they were. Now, let me tell you a little bit about Barnabas. Barnabas was a Levite from Cyprus. His given name was Joseph. Joseph. When he came to Christ, he sold his land and gave the money to the church. Later, when Saul was converted and came to Jerusalem, Barnabas stood up for him and his faith so that the church leaders would accept him. When Saul had to leave Jerusalem because Hellenistic Jews wanted to put him to death, Barnabas was well aware that he had gone home to his hometown of Tarsus. Meanwhile, Barnabas was sent to Antioch, and he was, in essence, the pastor to the church there. Luke called him a good man. Under the leadership of Barnabas in Antioch, this church continued to grow, and they were being led by the Holy Spirit in everything that they were doing. The Holy Spirit became central to their lives and to the things that they were choosing. So where does that leave you and me? Do we know who the Holy Spirit is? Are we baptized in the Holy Spirit? And do we live under the leading of the Spirit in our lives? My conversion before starting college was life transforming. I was converted to Jesus. But I wasn't yet converted to the church. The church I did not understand as well. I thought I could pick and choose and that I had options as to what I would do in relationship to the church. But I knew that I was falling in love with the church. Jesus had died for the church. The Holy Spirit wanted me to have deeper relationship with Christ and know the empowerment that comes through the Spirit living inside me in baptism in the Holy Spirit. So after 11 months of knowing Christ and salvation, when I was a sophomore at the University of Illinois, I went to a Catholic charismatic prayer meeting, and I experienced the presence of the Spirit in a way that I had not in anything that I had known up until that point in my journey with Christ. And before the night was out, I was baptized in the Holy Spirit, speaking in other tongues. My roommate, who was Catholic, prayed over me to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Certainly not expectations that you would think would take place. He himself was a brand new convert, and I knew that God's hand was on me like his hand had never been on me before. I had been witnessing to a Taiwanese student who was of Buddhist background, and I had spent hours and hours and hours with him sharing Christ. And the next morning after being baptized in the Holy Spirit, I was out on the, the quad at University of Illinois, and this student saw me across from on the other side, and he yelled out, John, I'm ready to be saved today. And I knew it was the Holy Spirit baptism. It wasn't just the empowerment that I had known before. And God was doing something brand new inside my life. The third thought to share with you is the hand of God leads us to love other people. Acts 11, 25 and 26. Then Barnabas went to Tarsus to look for Saul, and when he found him, he brought him to Antioch. So for, so for a whole year, Barnabas and Saul met with the church and taught great numbers of people. The disciples were called Christians first in Antioch. Soon, Barnabas recognized he needed help to pastor this church in Antioch. He remembered Saul of Tarsus. According to N.T. Wright, he may have been in Tarsus eight to ten years after leaving Jerusalem, and it seemed as if he was sidelined. 
preparing perhaps for ministry, but not being on the front line. So Barnabas went to Tarsus to invite him to come to Antioch and work together to share Christ, to disciple the believers there, and see that their lives would become all that God wanted them to be. I believe Barnabas and Saul had a great relationship with each other. They loved one another. They had respect. They could work together. They could esteem others more important than themselves. They could lift each other up in the ministry and together do more for God than they could have done alone. For the next year, Barnabas and Saul became a team. The believers in Antioch were being faithful to Jesus, and Saul was growing in his faith, and God was preparing him for future ministry in uh, taking the gospel to other parts of the world along with Barnabas. And God alone knew the possibilities as these two were working together. I believe that their lives became a demonstration of Jesus Christ and that there was victory in how they lived. And the reason why is because they loved God and they loved each other. So I have some questions once again. Are you loving in your home? Are you loving in your church? Are you loving in the community that God has made you a part? And would people call you a Christian based upon the conduct of your life? Now, I shared with you as we began that the church that I was a part of sent Diane and me on a sabbatical. And one of the places we went was to visit our children in Austin, Texas. And because the time off was so lengthy, it was the first time since salvation many years before and baptism in the Holy Spirit that God was given enough opportunity inside of me to get my attention like he hadn't had for maybe ever. And in the quietness, I recognized that God was speaking into my soul and asking of me to do things that were new that I wasn't sure about. I had spent 30 years in the same church and loved that church deeply, and God was peeling my fingers off of holding on to that family of God. My relationship with them was so deep, I thought, God, I don't know that I could ever leave this place. It would just be better if you'd kill me when you want me to go to, and take me to heaven because I don't know how I'd ever let go. But he was asking while we were in Texas on this sabbatical for me to surrender the church to him, to give it into his hands, and preparing Diane and me for something new, for something in our future and that the hand of God could come upon us in ways that he would choose, moving us into his will going forward. He showed us while we were there that he was the one all these years that had been connecting the dots, whereas I, by nature, am a type A person and by personality, that when I give my heart to something, I do so completely, that from the, the point of baptism of the Holy Spirit, I believe that I just needed to obey God. I needed to do what he asked me to do. I needed to move forward in uh, his will and pursue it wholeheartedly. And I was far more aware of Scripture that talks about pursuing God, uh, uh, seeking God with all your heart, surrendering completely. And I was less aware of being quiet with God and letting God speak into me. And at that place in life, I discovered God was seeking Diane. God was seeking me like I had not experienced in all those years between salvation, baptism, and the Holy Spirit and uh, being on sabbatical. And in that surrender, God prepared us for the changes that would take place in our future which led to us leaving Poplar Creek Church and going to the network office in Wapakon, serving in a new role as superintendent, realizing that it could only take place by the hand of God on our lives. 
So today I'd like to pray with you for the hand of God to be on you. Whatever he is putting inside your life and wanting to accomplish in your heart and soul, that he could do so by his hand. Now, as we looked at the scripture portion about the Lord's hand being with them, we, we gave emphasis that the Lord's hand was with them and. And the outcome was what would happen when the hand of God was on them. And that's what we want to pray for today, that the hand of God is on you and, and he will bring the results that he wants to come to pass. So, worship team, may invite you to come back, please. And as they do, would you consider the possibility of God's hand doing something in your life according to his appetite for your heart and soul and what he wants to happen as a next step? So if I could ask you to stand, please, and I'd like to pray with you today. Shall we pray? Lord, thanking you that you place your hand upon us, that you know what to do inside us, that you call us to Jesus and a knowledge of the word. You ask, it, ask us to surrender to the baptism in the Holy Spirit. And we thank you, Lord, that you have a purpose for our life that follows. And so today, Lord, Ask for the hand of the Lord to be upon students, upon each of us as we're in the room today, and whatever you want to take place to follow, that we are open, that we're surrendered, that we're experiencing who you are and all your glory and all your goodness and all of your grace. And we thank you for this in Jesus' name. If any of you would like to receive prayer for God's hand on you and the, the possibility from him will come to pass, I'd like to invite you to come to the front of the room right now, and we will pray together. Thank you so much. What a wonderful moment. It's right across the room. Women and men saying, Holy Spirit, use us. Lives are available. The potential of this moment could shake towns and cities and regions all across the world. So remain receptive, but I'm sure you want to join me and say to Pastor John Davis, thank you. Thank you for being the person you are, John. You have ministered to us, not just in word, just who you are has blessed this community today. And I want to say thank you with all of my heart. And I want to say thank you to Jesus for touching your life, the University of Illinois. What a gift you've become to the church. Thank you for testifying to the fullness of the Holy Spirit, the empowerment. And thank you that you've been obedient to God to lead one of our great districts. May God give you and Diane the best years of your lives, rich and full. And through you, literally the communities of that great state to be wonderfully impacted. Thank you. Thank you for serving us. Thank you for your kindness. Um, we want to thank you. What a great time. And those of you who are just, in a way, so sweetly receiving from God this morning. May your prayers be answered above and beyond what you could ever imagine or dream. Great days. So make sure you keep warm. Make sure you keep open to what God has to say. In the middle of that class where you're just counting down the minutes to finish, I want to tell you those are some of the moments that God could invade your life in a most profound way. Keep the expectation up. And let's believe God. Again, to all of our board, thank you. Thank you for not only coming and sitting around a board table. Uh, thank you so much for being in chapel today and sharing with the community. And uh, I'm going to pray God's blessing over all of our lives.
I pray today, God, for the hand of God and. The hand of God upon us and healing. The hand of God upon us and provision. The hand of God upon us and leading. The hand of God upon us and. Add to us the and of your will and of your goodness and of your grace. Lord, for those times where like Paul of Tarsus, we seem to just be having to be sidelined for a short while, I pray that the hand of God would be upon us and. That the end would be remarkable and amazing. You know, my prayer today, Lord, is that not one, not one in this room would be lost to your purpose or your plan. And I pray that you'd keep and save and preserve our lives for good. Thank you for Pastor John today and Diane. I pray you'd bless them in uh, the work that you've called them to do. And so part us with blessing and grace and your hand upon us. I ask it in Jesus' name. If you need to linger, stay at the front. Get somebody alongside you to pray. You do that. But uh, have a great day, everybody. God bless you. Thank you for listening to the Trinity Bible College and Graduate School podcast. If you like what you hear, be sure to hit that subscribe button and leave a comment. You can visit us online at www.trinitybiblecollege.edu.